Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome to Member Art Break. I'm Rachel Balmer and I'm the Milwaukee Art Museum's Director of Membership. And I'm so pleased to welcome you to today's Member Art Break with Art Mohagen, the museum's Chief Art Preparator. Today, Art will be sharing um, a bit of a behind the scenes look about the incredible work of his Art Preparator team um, and some projects that they've been working on at the museum. Um, but before we get started today, uh, we of course wanted to offer our sincere thanks to you, our members joining us today. Uh, we have been so thrilled to have been able to reopen the museum's galleries just a couple short weeks ago after almost a, or over a full year of, of having those spaces closed. So it's been wonderful to have our second floor and our mezzanine reopen um, and being able to share those spaces with our community once again. And we, we hope you are joining us and taking pride in this really exciting moment um, because you have helped make this possible. So if you haven't already been able to join us uh, for a visit, or even if you have, I, I hope you'll plan a visit in the, the coming weeks and months. Um, in addition to the collection spaces that are now reopened, we also have five um, special exhibitions on view. So there's so much to explore. Um, and again, thanks for, for all you do to help make this possible. Um, and then um, before I turn things over to Art today, just a couple of notes on our program format. Um, we will be using the chat feature below for our Q&A. Um, as you think of questions during Art's presentation, feel free to type those in. Um, we'll be answering questions as we can throughout. And then of course at the end, um, and Amy Kirschke, our Director of Adult, Docent, and School Programs, hi Amy, um, she'll be helping moderate those, uh, those questions today. So thank you, Amy, for that. Um, and then um, to close things out, Elizabeth Kasparka, our Development Officer for Membership, will be uh, closing out our program today and uh, alerting you of a couple things to watch out for. Um, so I think with that, we are ready to get started. And I'm so pleased to introduce you to Art Mohagen the museum's chief art preparator. Um, art was born in Western New York. He is the son to a high school art teacher. And uh, fun fact, he is now married to a high school art teacher. He attended Fredonia State University before moving to Wisconsin to earn a master's of fine arts in painting from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2006. And then he moved to Milwaukee in 2011. Um, art started at the Milwaukee Art Museum in 2014, and a few installation highlights that he, he shared with, with us were the, the installation of a Jackson Pollock painting, um, the construction of the Wassily Kandinsky mural room, which I'm sure many of you remember from that uh, retrospective several years ago, um, and also, very notably, the reinstallation of the museum's entire collection galleries during MAM's 2015 reno uh, renovation. Um, which during that time, approximately 30,000 objects were moved. So that's an incredible highlight. Um, and so with that, I am, we're ready to get things started today. I'm gonna turn things over to Art. Um, but to begin our program, we're actually gonna start with a short video. This video was part of our member preview celebration for our Americans in Spain virtual opening program. And as part of that program, we were able to give a behind, the scene look, a, a behind the scenes look at some of the museum teams that bring our exhibitions to life. And Art's team is certainly one of those teams. And this video is just a really nice intro to what Art will be sharing with us today. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna play this video. My name is Art Mohagen. I'm the Chief Art Preparator at the Milwaukee Art Museum. Uh, right now we're standing in the general operations area of the museum. This is where my team of six preparators build, construct, and prepare for uh, exhibitions. So my team works closely with the exhibition design department. We'll get a design of our traveling exhibition gallery and that'll display all of the 43 movable walls we have and how they need to be installed the 
galleries take a lot of time to deconstruct the walls, match the walls together, mate the walls together, and then take raw materials and build in archways and headers that join the walls together and form unique passageways into these rooms. Here in the wood shop, we've got all of the casework and all of the crates that are built for the exhibition. We do that in-house. We have the loading dock where we unload all of the trucks and all of the crates from the exhibition. And then we store them in the vault. And then we have the installation up in the gallery where our team works with uh, visiting couriers and visiting registrars to make sure that the work is in the right condition, but also mounted and installed with the uh, curators and have the exhibition you know, pulled off flawlessly. All right, so take it away, Art. Great. Thanks, guys. It's good to be uh, with all of you today. I mean, it's a really unique opportunity for us to talk with members, um, one of the core groups of the museum that my team works particularly hard to please. It's really exciting to do a lot of this work behind the scenes, but now get to share some of the back story behind it all with, um, with members, as typically we're um, hidden away from you and get to do all of our work uh, either before the museum opens or behind closed doors. So it's nice to be able to present this information to you guys uh, today. So um, just a little bit of backstory about my team and where we're located, and then I'll um, shoot into a presentation. I have five uh, extremely talented uh, coworkers that work alongside me in the, mu the museum's art preparation department. So we prepare the gallery spaces for exhibition, we uh, ship and receive all the art that comes in and out of the museum, whether it's for our own collection or for traveling exhibits. And then we also build and construct um, the crates that the artwork is shipped in, but also build and construct all the gallery furniture or support material that the galleries need, whether that's pedestals, platforms, um, documents, tables, and so on for the, for the galleries. Um, and finally, the thing that is most exciting about our job is, you know, opening up artwork out of crates and installing them on the walls. That's where our expertise really lies. We are um, meticulous about that, and it's an absolute thrill to, um, to do that for the museum. So my six uh, team members work alongside the registration department, who documents and uh, essentially is the librarians for all of the artwork that comes in and out of the museum. And also the conservation department, who cleans the artwork, prepares the artwork, and um, make sure, you know, essentially conserves the artwork to make sure it lasts a long time for everybody to see. Um, so with that in mind, I'll, I'll share my screen and launch into my presentation. Um, first presentation um, is about preparing for a traveling exhibit. So we do multiple things here. We have uh, three traveling exhibition spaces in the museum that all change over after the course of an exhibition. And we also have our typical collection galleries. So besides maintenance in the collection galleries, we do like to rotate the art in the collection galleries a lot. But also our job really is to prepare um, an exhibition space for a new traveling exhibit. So there's good reason why we have the doors closed and screens in front of the doors and the windows blocked off when we're doing a transition from one exhibition to another. Um, sometimes that can be six and a half, seven weeks long. And we often get the question, well, what, what's in there? What's happening in there? And so I'll try to um, pull back the curtain a little bit today to show you what a massive transformation happens in our Baker Rowland um, traveling exhibition galleries, as well as our Bradley family gallery, where we also have traveling exhibitions. So a lot of the times these are exhibits that um, are coordinated by our institution, but they are also very much coordinated by other institutions. And we work with them to bring in works that are loaned uh, to us and also kind of work with the other curators to design a gallery layout that is um, appropriate for the artwork that we're showing. So instead of really large paintings, maybe the next show will be really small photographs and so on and so forth. So we work with the exhibition design department to get the right plan for the curators to have the gallery change and morph into a new um, unique experience. Uh, this was something before I worked in the museum field, 
you know, had no idea how this had happened and just was always, always marveled at how the, the gallery looks completely different every time there's an exhibit. So that's my um, responsibility to coordinate those moves and also to coordinate with my team and how to make that happen. So the first slide is um, a great glimpse into the Baker Rowland Gallery's pre-exhibition installation where you have these walls that are constructed and archways built for you to pass through. And you can see just what a mess the gallery can become once the artwork is removed. So we're using raw materials, drywall, sanding, um, all sorts of different materials to basically construct the gallery into a new unique um, exhibit. Um, the, second, this, the second slide I wanna show highlights some of the nasty work that also happens, things that are often overlooked. And so you can see that these um, temporary walls just have to be removed. So it's a demolition. Sometimes a construction company comes in and helps us. Sometimes it's my crew knocking a wall down and hauling the debris away. Um, oftentimes people ask about the, um, the inter introductions and text panels that happens in the gallery and how that is installed. These are um, tiny little vinyl letters that are installed on the wall. And um, while this is an absolute wonderful way to tell a story and exhibit, this is a, um, a, a huge time commitment for my team to peel off each letter off the wall and then either repaint or reinstall when the gallery changes over. So you can see one of my teammates, Bob, using a heat gun to warm up the letters and uh, get the adhesive um, hot so you can peel these letters off the wall. Um, this is like a great uh, look into um, the Nair's Moves exhibit construction and all of the different moving parts that had to come together to make a super unique room uh, hold six different uh, portrait videos. So this was just a big open space and uh, um, the team constructed freestanding walls that were then tied into a ceiling that was installed that was much lower than the actual ceiling. And you can see these different views show like different parts of how we've had it constructed the ceiling, how to make this kind of like a, like a video room and how um, construction and painting was a very big part of getting this exhibition uh, together. This is a really good example of another um, changing exhibition we have upstairs. This is uh, an exhibit that I'm thrilled that people get to see more of. This was an exhibition that was cut short um, during the COVID uh, pandemic stop, stoppage and our Birdcliff exhibition in our um, American Highlights Gallery. So this is another, another thing that our team is just absolute experts at. And this is craftsmanship, um, carpentry craftsmanship on another level here. So this is our loading dock. And you can see that this is a modular platform that my team had to build well in advance of this um, exhibition. So each of these pieces are put together and assembled in such a way where they can be taken apart and then hauled up a freight elevator and installed in the gallery so we can have seven or eight unique three-dimensional objects installed on them to tell the um, story of this exhibit. So this is something that, you know, while I have two team members off installing some art in one part of the gallery, I have another two team members down in our general operations area down here in the Base Mini Museum building and constructing uh, these risers and platforms. Uh, this is a great example uh, from raw materials to finished product. And this is another thing that we're really thrilled with. We have an expert team that builds these um, pedestals to highlight these objects in these uh, exhibits. So on the left, you can see the basic um, beginning structure of one of our pedestals. And on the right, you can see its finished product in the gallery. Also something that we do in-house, a lot of museums are gonna send off their artwork to us and they might not have the capacity to build a crate to store their artworks safely and ship them to us. So they're often, um, they hire art shipping companies to do this. This is something we pride ourselves on here at the museum. We build all of our shipping crates in-house and we do this in such a way that, you know, um, we can send our artworks off. Like we, we very often get requests for Georgia O'Keeffe paintings and so on and so forth that are, are very sought after and people want to see these in other cities. So in-house, we build crates that store the artwork and we can load the artwork into the crate, put it on a truck, ship it across the country and they can open it safely. So here on the left, you can see Paul, our crate builder, 
um, doing some measuring and building um, a crate. And then on the right, you can see various different crates stored in one of our uh, holding areas at the museum. This is a great example of a finished crate on our left, but also what it looks like when a museum sends us a traveling exhibit to install at our museum. So not only is my staff um, in charge of building crates and receiving the crates, but we also have to open every single one of these. And to get them into the museum, we load them off semi trucks. And that's, um, you know, that is a very physical, physical task. And you can see them all stored in our uh, museum vault so the artwork can climatize. And then we take them up to the gallery to open them up. Um, so as you can see, Paul building that crate, it has an inner box that slides into a larger box. And what you see on the right is a really unique device um, that the museum owns called the Crate Tipper. And what that does is allows us to tilt the crate from an upright position to a flat position. And so on the right, you can see this inner box or a travel frame, as they're called, has the painting inside of there. And it was slid outside of a larger crate. The Crate Tipper allows the painting to move very gracefully from upright to horizontal. So we can take the lid off and extract the painting. And this is a great image of our team cut from that video we showed earlier of uh, the preparators pulling a painting out of a travel frame uh, so that um, exhibit uh, conservators can look at the painting, make sure it's in the exact same condition that it was when it was loaded in the crate before we install it on the wall. This is a great example from a traveling exhibition we had just a few years ago, our Bougaro exhibition. Um, these are, you know, it, we, we do everything from small uh, books to small two-dimensional photographs and images, all the way up to extremely ornate heavy frames. And you can see that these are absolute team efforts, things that we really get a kick out of seeing how other institutions mount their paintings and install their paintings. And this is um, a really great example of how my team works. Um, you know, it, it coordinates together and works on each thing um, as a team. So that's a traveling exhibit, and I'm happy to take questions on that when we get to that point, because it's a very complex process with other departments and other institutions that we partner with. But here in the museum, we often are rotating our collection galleries as well. Um, this was a gallery that just turned over from a Bradley Highlights collection gallery uh, to now the chapter one of our American Memory um, installation, which is absolutely fantastic that we have these spaces in the museum that we can rotate and activate our collection. We have so many absolutely fabulous things in storage that don't often get shown. So when we have a chance to change things in the museum's collection galleries, um, for us, it's very exciting. So here's a great example of what we do when we visit um, with our uh, curators that are on site, on staff, and we work with our designer to lay out an exhibition space with a new collection. So this was a, um, this was a rotation we did um, for Robert Indiana a few, I think maybe a year or two ago, um, we often meet in the gallery with all the artwork and before we install it on the wall, we either lay the artwork out in the predetermined locations that the, the designer and the curator has come up with. And we just put them on ethafoam or styrofoam pads on the ground. So they're safe to kind of be pushed around or moved around so we can get the spacing right for the exhibit. Um, this is a great example of when there's more than just one or two artworks. We lay a lot of like cardboard down or something that we can leave on the floor and then mock out a grid for our curator and designer to look at and almost imagine what it would be like to beam that up to the wall. So this is a really neat process. We get to hear the inner workings of what it's like to design these exhibits before we put them up. Um, this is a great way for artwork to get swapped out or moved around or just to visualize it before we start putting holes in the wall. Um, this is after we, we get that information, we mark it on the wall. This is a really, this is an insight in like looking at the backs of these artworks. There's a lot of measurements we have to take on the artworks to make sure they're hung on the wall level, to make sure it's appropriately hung, to make sure it's secure to the wall, um, to know the weight of the wall, to know how far the hooks are apart. And then you can see taking measurements on the wall to make sure it's in the exact right spot on the wall. And then you can just see the grid being installed on the wall, how we've kind of um, taken the measurements on the floor, took the artwork away, and then transferred those measurements to the wall and installed them. Uh, this was a great uh, Gorilla Girls exhibit that we did 
um, a few years back in one of our changing uh, contemporary galleries as well. So those are easy kind of installations, framed artworks, you know, or you know, something that we find easy, you know, still thrilling, but not nearly as thrilling as installing the Cornelia Parker's Edge of England sculpture in the collection galleries. Um, this, this was months in the making, maybe longer, but this is something that we really have to scratch our brains um, to kind of come up with solutions to these problems. So when the museum was reinstalled in 2015, this was something we kind of reinvented to make sure that this sculpture was um, hung really elegantly, but also showed the honesty of materials and what it takes to dangle, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pieces of rock from our ceiling. So we had anchored into our ceiling, we had a number of threaded anchors. And then this is an image of um, our, our, our skyjacker scissor lift where we have two um, employees on and we also have two roller lifts, which are these really large hydraulic type ladder systems. And at the very top above the um, blankets and the two by fours, you can see we have this wire, um, wire structure that we built in house. And it's made of um, this, you know, almost like a, you know, it's, it's, it's just rolled steel tubing that we've pieced together and then put metal wire across and then labeled each spot on there where each strand of rocks were to be hung. And so we jacked each of these um, hydraulic ladders up to the ceiling to hoist this really heavy metal structure up there and then installed it into the ceiling and then pulled that those away so we could um, install each strand of rocks uh, as the artist intended. So really fun problem solving and um, also like working as a team to, to do something much larger than a um, you know, a small two-dimensional print. Now we have an extremely large footprint 3D sculpture. This was um, another uh, installation too. I'll play the video, but some two-dimensional artworks that hang on the wall are different than others. Um, when Rashid Johnson visited our museum to do our traveling exhibit there, we worked really closely with him. He visited the museum. He was fantastic to work with, but his paintings were hundreds and hundreds of pounds made out of subway tile and bathroom tile. And so they were extremely heavy and we had to come up with really great systems to store them and also install them. So um, this installation took three days, but it's um, maybe a, I don't know, 30 second video. So it'll, it speeds it up quite a bit, but you can um, see all the coordination and tools involved in um, installing one of these paintings on a wall. And so here's us bringing this painting out of uh, storage in its travel frame. And each one of these paintings, this is only half of the painting. And you can see we're using a lot of tools to kind of gently lower the painting to the ground, removing its uh, crate face. And this is a hydraulic pedal lift that we padded the bottom to lift up this painting. Kind of inch by inch, bringing it closer to the wall and lowering it down onto its cleat. And then it's very carefully pieced together to get us one beautiful painting. So again, two days in about 30 seconds, but uh, a real treat to work on something like that, you know. Um, the next video is something that took maybe even longer than that Rashid uh, Johnson painting to install. Now, this is a great example of the museum working with partner institutions and partner vendors across the city and state. Um, and while my team was uh, integral to getting this sculpture landed on our lakefront, you can see in this video how many other people came together from construction companies pouring the footing um, to the designer designing the layout of uh, the landscaping, the landscaping company coming and finishing the land, a lighting company coming in and installing the lights before the sculpture was there. And most importantly, working with a local rigging company in Milwaukee that typically, I mean, they move a lot of heavy sculptures and do a lot of this work for us. And they're a very trusted partner, but oftentimes they're lifting air conditioning units on the top of skyscrapers. So it's really great to get expertise like that locally. And so this is a video of the uh, Love Sculpture coming to the museum. You can see the massive size of the crate that it was delivered in. We had a wonderfully hot and beautiful sunny day to do this. So it's been really fun that we had it all filmed.
It's just not something you see every day, a big love sculpture floating through the air. Uh, Rachel, when I sent you the highlights of the things I've done at the museum, this is one I forgot, but definitely is on the list. This was a real thrill to see this uh, turn into basically an icon in Milwaukee now in front of uh, you know, the museum's new East edition on our link front. Yeah, hats off to our video department too. They do a great job of making sure none of this stuff is lost and, do, uh, and, and not being able to be seen again because this was a really unique installation that we were all pretty proud of. So then the last image I like, I like, I wanted to end on before I move to the next presentation is not only did we help plan the sculpture and install it there, but we were tasked with making sure it was hidden and off view before it was actually unveiled to the public a few days later. So here it is wrapped in shrink wrap and blankets so nobody could see it. Um, with that, I'll stop sharing if we wanted to do any questions on this. Um, I think a really unique, um, a unique thing that my department also got to do was when we took a break when the museum was closed for a number of months uh, during our, our uh, COVID um, uh, shutdown at the museum, we had a really op a great opportunity to improve a lot of things at the museum. And so that was something we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. Great, thank you so much, Art. This has already been fantastic. Uh, we do have a couple questions. Great. So Jill asks, I know how creative the exhibition designers are, but only you would know if their designs could be built or not. Have you had some challenges with those strange shaped openings or angled walls that needed to be redesigned a little? Yeah, we, de we work really closely with them. And, you know, the interesting thing about the design department is the design department does a really good job in coming up with initial plans early on uh, with the um, curator, but they're very flexible as well. So um, the design can only be done when it fits the time schedule of the museum and its resources. So um, I say that in terms of um, each exhibition is publicized and planned years in advance. And sometimes we have a hard opening date that we just cannot move. And so a lot of the design still has to go around um, those, uh, those dates when artwork is getting shipped to us, when visitors from other institutions are installing the art. So we have a set amount of time that we have to make those design configurations happen. And that's where early on, I work with the designer and the curator to say, well, that's gonna just take us way too long. We're either gonna need to hire a construction company to do that, and it's gonna, you know, it's gonna change um, how many vendor partners we have come in and do that. Or yeah, we, we can do that in house, but we'll need this amount of time. So sometimes they're flexible enough to take something out and simplify it. Um, or we're gonna have to go out, think outside the box and have somebody come in and do that for us. So we, we iron that stuff out in advance. So there's very rarely any sort of surprise when we're doing that in physical, actual reality in the gallery. Um, I wouldn't say that never happens. We're always making adjustments. When I was first hired here seven or eight years ago, that was literally day one, the thing they talked about. Um, the number one thing that my department has to be is flexible. We have to come up with flexible solutions and extremely quick, um, quick acting solutions to make that stuff happen to get to certain deadlines. So things do get altered. Um, we've had, we've had to extend platforms, you know, maybe we received a piece of artwork in that is actually bigger than the dimensions that they told us. Um, we have to make sure that everything is safe before um, it goes off. So we'll, we've certainly made adjustments, but all the large scale 
uh, decisions are done such in advance that we usually don't get surprised by too much. Great. Uh, one more question um, related to outdoor installations. Uh, Laura is wondering if you were at the museum when the car was installed outside. So I'm assuming the Dirk Scraper. On yeah, the car. yeah, yeah. That was. I was not here when it got installed, but I was here when it was taken away, which was just as unique. So, um, so I, I can speak to that a little bit because it was uh, very similar um, to the Love sculpture. You know, beyond our expertise, um, the safety of the public, the safety of the sculpture, the safety of the employees that are um, taking a car off of a pole from an elevated position. So um, we coordinated with the Lent because it was not our car. It was not our artwork. It was lent to us by the artist in the gallery that represents him. So we had it on long term loan for his exhibit here. Um, and it was part of that exhibit. And once that exhibit went away, the, um, very often that happens, the, the loan is extended um, a certain amount of time to allow the, you know, the public to view it longer, or it's not an artwork that has a specific home where they need it back. Um, and so that was the case with the Dirk Scraper car. And so it was a matter of um, getting that back to them. And so we hired the same rigging company that we're familiar with, and they were the ones that installed it as well. Um, so they worked closely with the gallery and the artist to, either, to put it up and take it down safely and get it back to them. Great. I think that's all the questions for now. Um, if people can peep, keep adding them uh, as you go into your next segment, though. Thanks so much, Art. Sure, you're welcome. Yeah, and, I, and to speak uh, real quickly on what um, Rachel said earlier, the museum's second floor and mezzanine are now open, and that was something that during our time with the museum being closed was a great opportunity for my team um, to uh, essentially maintain the galleries that have been uh, open six or seven days a week for five years since we first installed them. So take, for example, the Bradley Family, or I'm sorry, the Bradley Collection Galleries. Those galleries house some of the greatest artworks that the museum owns. Uh, they are almost all installed on white walls. And I don't think I have to emphasize how easy it is for a white wall to get beat up. So over the course of the um, summer and fall when those galleries were closed, we removed, um, I'd say 75% of the artworks from the wall and repainted the entire Bradley Collection galleries white. So whether it's, you know, school children's footprints or, you know, rubs from blue jeans, uh, pencil marks from uh, kids going through doing a, um, you know, doing a writing project. Regardless, that is maintenance that is very, very hard to do when the museum was closed one day a week. Um, and we certainly don't want to take these artworks off view when you visit. So this is something that cleaning the walls and touching up the walls, um, you could see their, your, their years of use. And so those galleries look better than ever now. And that's something we take pride in too. But, uh, they look, they look brand new, which is uh, wonderful. Um, another project that we have been uh, working on for a number of years before our um, COVID closure was our Baker Rowland walls. Um, I'll share my screen now. And to give you a glimpse into what um, happens in that Baker Rowland gallery when a traveling exhibit comes in, um, some of the images here will be in preparation for Americans in Spain, which is the show that is on view now. Um, it's gonna talk, I'm gonna talk today about how my team, the art preparation team works with the design department, the facilities department, construction uh, companies, flooring companies, um, all sorts of different vendors to make an exhibition happen. And so each exhibition, um, each exhibition has 43 movable walls in the Baker Rowland Gallery. So oftentimes people ask how the gallery changes and that's because each one of these walls um, is lifted a couple inches off the ground and pushed around the gallery. So we have 43 walls, three to four exhibitions a year and each time they're getting changed around. We've got seven eight foot long walls, 19 10 foot walls and 17 12 foot walls. So for my team, it's our job to move them, put them back together and make them looking great. Um, for the design department, it's their job to change the configuration and give us that configuration so we can do that. 
So each exhibition, this map is given to us and it's um, each wall is labeled, whether it's an eight foot, 10 foot or 12 foot. And this is all done with, you know, the, the checklist for that exhibition in mind. So they can look at the artworks, work with the curator and figure out what, how the gallery is gonna uh, look best. So as you can see on the bottom right image, each wall is lifted up in place and rolled to its new location. Now this was um, a system that we inherited when um, my team started working here. But when the museum's um, Calatrava edition was built, these walls were built, so 2001. So we're talking 20 years of exhibitions, sometimes three or four exhibitions a year. That is a lot of uh, moving and that's a lot of abuse. And that was something that we have been desperate to redo for years. So for um, before our COVID closure, we would try to sneak in redoing these walls between each exhibition. And that was extremely hard and extremely expensive. But as you can see in the images here, these walls were essentially crumbling and falling apart and it took a lot of material to put them back together. So not only were they falling apart, but they were producing a lot of waste and you can see that they've become completely uneven, changed shapes and become nearly impossible to line up in a straight line. You know, this is a great example of all the material that we add to the walls to make it look better. And you can see up in the right hand corner, like they just don't line up anymore because they're just not square. So my team in the upper left throwing all this extra material away after an exhibition is um, over. This was something that we just struggled with. We really didn't like creating so much um, waste. And as you can see, the bottom illustration shows these walls were just morphing in shape and becoming very difficult for us to manage. Uh, this is a finished product. So for our Rashid Johnson exhibition, you can see the finished product is pretty ugly. This was something we did. This is not our, this is not our best look. Uh, we, we have these big humps in the wall. And as you can see on the, the image to the right, we have the, the two images on the right. You can see these paintings had to be um, shimmed off the wall to allow them to be hung safely. So they're flush on one side and essentially teetering off the wall on the other side. So it was a scary thing for us to have to adapt to right away because our walls were just not straight. Um, yeah, that was at a point where we said something's gotta give and we gotta change. Uh, another thing that makes the museum's walls not sit appropriately or actually make together is that the floor was in also 20 years of abuse and uh, also was in really rough shape. So for two reasons, one, because these walls are, you know, weigh tons and we lift them up and drop them down. And we have all this material being scattered on the floor and ground into the floor. So the finish was just abused. Um, beyond that, the, the floorboards also have cupped from years of abuse and they become really rough and bumpy. Um, you know, it was just a rushed process when the building was built and we've never been thrilled with it. So we took a long, hard look at this and used uh, the coronavirus closure as an absolute opportunity to um, fix both of these, um, both of these problems in our, in our highlight gallery. So this is a good example. You know, we wanted to do a renewal of the floor and we wanted to reskin each one of these walls. So the inner structure of the wall is still there, but we wanted to pull all the material off the wall and put a brand new skin on the wall. To do that, um, we needed some, you know, very important help from um, construction partners and uh, donors to the museum that were huge contributors to this. So we first had to do deconstruction of the wall material. So you can see that that's a wall that is being taken apart. And then we had to start hauling all the debris away. And here's a great picture of this halfway through the process. All the walls are pushed to the left side of the gallery. And you can see that the floor refinishing process is in place. A brand new sanded floor with a new finish and a ugly shiny floor with tons of, um, you know, scrapes, gouges, marks, just blemishes that, um, you know, as a museum employee, we'd walk around and um, just be frustrated at the end product. So this was our summer last year, going through this entire process of moving every single single one of these walls, taking the material off the walls, 
and then reinstalling brand new material on the wall to get them to be perfectly straight and brand new walls. Um, our second step was improving the baseboard system. Uh, again, a, a system we inherited was attaching really large, flexible baseboards to the walls. And that was in response to the walls not being straight. So now we have straight walls. So we've extended the baseboards all the way to the floor. And you can see the difference on the right versus the difference. I mean, this is our old baseboard system. And the difference on the, the new, new baseboard system is a tiny, small, little hole to pick the walls up with our machines. And then the system to the left, which required a lot of material, a lot of um, debris, a lot of waste. And now we have no waste and less material being used and a much better look that the curator and designers um, appreciate and have kind of come up with. So the walls just look a lot cleaner all the way to the floor. Um, just some more uh, views of the baseboards. And you can see how different the walls are now, how crisp they are, how clean they are, and how this is gonna make a really big impact on exhibitions going forward. Um, a old baseboard system, you can see that line running through the bottom versus the new hidden baseboard system on the right. Each exhibition will remove that little plate that's on the bottom of the wall, pick it up, drop it in its location, install that new little plate, and then mud over that crack so it's invisible. So here's some after pictures. I mean, the gallery floor and the gallery walls just look better than ever. Um, so we had decided that the way to keep these in that condition was um, use a ratcheting attachment system. So this is, we add these little brackets onto the ends of the walls. We add those plates onto the end of the walls. We lift them up just a couple inches off the ground and we tug them into place by these ratchet straps. And so we can move them, you know, a fraction of inches at a time instead of just trying to use our physical manpower to move them and hope that they're in the right, right place. So much more technical. You can see the system on the left. They are, you know, mated together perfectly. And the end product is the right, a totally seamless straight wall. There's a couple more views of the gallery. This is a before and an after. I mean, I think they kind of speak for themselves. And this is one of my favorite before and afters. You can see how much material we had it um, used to hide those cracks when they butted up next to a perimeter wall. And to the right, almost no material needed. Old wall versus new wall. So this was something that my department has been working on for a long time, but because of the COVID closure, we were able to accelerate this by two or three years worth of work in the matter of a summer. And so ultimately what we have is a much better traveling exhibition gallery. Thank you, Art. Again, really, it's, you know, who knew walls were so important? And uh, I would have to just echo the fact that the museum has never looked better. The galleries look amazing. I know a lot of folks with us today will have visited, but if you haven't, please, please come down. It's really, um, everything looks fantastic. I don't have any additional questions just yet, but I hope people will, will enter them into the chat box if they think of them. And um, yeah, I know I should think of one. <laughs> So I think, um, well, I guess I'll add a little note here and Art, you'll know this, um, but we have, I work in education and I also, I guess I should apologize for all the, the marks we leave on the walls with our wonderful programs. I think we are, we're one of the reasons we needed to do a lot of that repainting, but it's such a thrill for children when they visit the museum to see the work in action. And I think um, you always steal the show when tour groups come through and they get to, to learn more about um, how a museum works. And of course, it's a great bonus that your name is Art. And I think we have so many kids who on our surveys will say, we love that we met um, a man named Art who takes care of the art. So I just wanted to add that. And that there. joke's never gonna get old, Amy. It's I'm, never I'm gonna always get old. ready to roll with it, that's okay. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. All right. So Julie asks, are all the movable walls used for special exhibits in some way, or are they tucked behind somewhere hidden from view? Wow, that is a very insightful question. That's excellent. Um, yeah, so we have those 43 movable walls, and that is, um, it, it actually does vary from exhibition to exhibition. And I would say probably 75% of the time we're going to use every single one of those walls. 
Uh, that being said, sometimes we are coordinating the wall moves around an exhibition store that's at the end of the exhibit, or sometimes we are using uh, less walls because of the amount of artworks that are installed. Take, for example, the Rashid Johnson installation, or even more recently, the, a, the, um, the video installation we did of, um, I'm drawing a blank, but uh, I'll come up with it in a minute. But either way, it was one artwork and I think 11 artworks as compared to um, the Americans in Spain, uh, William Tentridge uh, video that we did. The, the Americans in Spain exhibit has hundreds of artworks on display. So much, much more um, needs for the walls. So we often do have exhibits that will not use all 43 walls in the design. And so we will um, do a number of different things, but what we can do is we can make some sort of room and uh, push those walls in there and then close off those walls from view. So they're literally in the gallery, but they're off view, so you can't see them. That is like a unique feature about the walls is that we cannot get them out of the gallery. They were built in that gallery and they're too large and too big to, to remove from the gallery. So we're stuck with them unless we wanna take them apart or explode them or build them into a raft, but they are, they're there. So we either have to hide them uh, or use them. And so oftentimes we'll use everyone. And if not, we can store a few of them in like a hidden room. Great. Um, I also, we had a question come in advance that I'll get to in just a moment, Art, but another one related to the walls. How is the joint between the wall panels filled smooth and unfilled when an exhibit changed? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and in that presentation, I highlighted some of the changes that were made. And so previous, um, you had the walls touch each other. And if they weren't um, perfectly straight, a lot of material or like wet drywall mud or drywall spackle was put on those walls to make a smooth transition. So that would be install or move the walls together, put the mud over, and then sand it to make it smooth. What that was doing was adding material to the walls and therefore widening them and making them lopsided. So the improvement that we made is to add a half inch of wood to each end of each one of those walls and put that a quarter of an inch set into the wall. So when we join them together, we have a little tiny gap in between each wall and we add the material or that wet drywall mud that dries to that gap and then the wall is sanded so it's totally smooth. And when we pick up the walls, we physically pick them up with our hydraulic lifts and move them around, that spackle just cracks and breaks off and we can scrape that away from that part of the wall. So the material actually isn't sticking to the wall, it's sticking to that cleat that is uh, on the inside of the wall. So that's a great question as well. Thank you. And now Enid, Enid, thank you. This is the question that was sent in advance and we definitely want to get to um, a little bit of a different topic related to frames. So Enid asks, we are intrigued by the frames on paintings. We wonder if we would react differently to the piece if it had a different name. Who selects a frame? The artist? The owner of the piece? Can you change a frame on a piece that comes from a collection on loan to you? That's great. Those are, I mean, those are fantastic questions. And the answer is kind of all of the above, you know, it really does depend artwork to artwork. So to go into that in more detail, um, I have a few different examples. Um, the easy one, easiest one to um, get out of the way is anything that's loaned to us, the um, lending institution or the loaner, maybe if it's a private loan or whatever, all those decisions are made by them. That is not a decision we can make without their input. So let's say a painting is sent to us from a lender we don't have the ability or the right to change their frame. Even if we were to want to adjust the frame to make it safer or to, or we notice something happened in transit, we have to contact them and do that in tandem with them. That is their artwork. The loan agreement is very specific that that is their responsibility. So we work with them. Now, uh, um, when it, it comes in terms of artwork that we own, items that are part of our collection, we have certain, um, abilities to make certain decisions. However, all of this is done with research, um, all, of the, all of the scholarly input that the artwork comes with. Like if this is an old master's European painting, it's very rare that that painting is not framed. We're not gonna frame that in something that we see fit. We're gonna frame that in terms of historic reference. Typically it has um, a frame, but we're not gonna change it to something that is not 
referenced by the historical reference that those paintings come with. So that being said, I think one of the things you said was, would you note, would you look at a painting differently if it wasn't framed? Um, a extremely unique experience that we have here at the museum and in our operations area and working with the conservation department is looking at a painting when it is on frame. Um, oftentimes paintings are sent out on loan or need cleaning or some sort of touch up. And most of the time they're taken out of their frames to do that. And that is by far one of the greatest things that happens when a painting is unframed. It completely changes, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. But to see that canvas stretched around its stretcher bars and how it's painted to the edge or how it's not, it totally changes the way you view it. It's extremely unique to see that. Now, oftentimes we do have the ability to make a decision in framing. And a, and a great example is something that is not, um, something that does not come with a frame or has not doesn't have a very big historical reference around it. Uh, a contemporary painting that we just installed was our Ray Yoshida painting. Uh, that is a fabulous painting that we just installed in the contemporary galleries. That is a painting that was made 30-ish years ago in Chicago. The frame was not extremely important to the artist because it, it didn't really have a frame on it. And um, to be displayed, we thought it was appropriate that it should. So the curator and the, our framer in our conservation department worked uh, together to pick the right frame stock and um, choose the right material to highlight the painting, not necessarily highlight the frame and um, work together. And we created our own frame in-house and it's on view right now. And it's a fabulous upgrade for that painting. The greatest thing about frames for us is they truly do, they might make you see the painting in a different light, most of the time highlighting it, but they absolutely protect the painting. It's something that's really important for us. When we pick up artwork at lenders, houses, or um, visiting institutions, when a frame isn't painted, it's much, much, much more difficult to handle. It's much um, safer to handle when it has a frame. It's safer to store when it has a frame. It's safer to install when it has a frame. And so those are important decisions that are, um, or considerations that are, are thought about when we're, we're choosing frames for paintings in the collection. Did Great. I hit on them all? I I think so. Great. That was that was fantastic. Um, another question from Kathleen. It was fascinating to see the monumental paintings in the Americans in Spain exhibition. Can you share how the larger paintings were transported from Spain? Were they flat or possibly rolled? Yeah, those are great questions. We have um, received loan paintings that were rolled. It's very, very, very rare that that's the case, but that has happened. Um, uh, I can think of a few, but in Americans in Spain, those are in terms of large paintings that we display at the museum, those are not large paintings, which is really uh, unique to know. We've dealt with some extremely large paintings, but typically um, what happens with a large painting is depending on the weight of the painting and its uh, condition and how fragile it is, it'll be put in an inner travel frame box and loaded into a large crate. And they're almost always shipped upright and they almost always are shipped directionally, meaning that there's directional cues on the crate for the shipper, whether it's the air handlers, the, sh the airplanes or the trucks to make sure that the painting is um, running for front to back, not sideways. So whatever um, motion or movement in the air is not slapping at the canvas that it's going by it. So it's a really unique way, but it's always shipped upright. And then we move it upright on our uh, four wheel dollies. We lift that, we lift it up in, in like four or five people groups. We lift up one side, um, move it through the galleries on wheels and then set it down upright. And typically what we do is we lean it against a wall to brace the painting. And then we remove the lid and slide the painting out and, and um, install it that way. So almost all the exhibits or all the paintings in this exhibit were just in standard painting uh, crates. Um, a few of the ones that I can, um, that come to mind are when we did uh, the traveling exhibit from the Albright Knox, it's called Modern Rebels. We had two or three paintings that um, were stretched canvases that were too large to fit on a 18 wheel semi truck. Now these were traveling across the country from Buffalo. They weren't on cargo, you know, planes or anything, but the, they had to tilt, they had to basically have a metal fabricator build them uh, kind of like an A-frame structure on wheels. So the painting could be tilted at a 45 degree angle and loaded in the truck. So those paintings took extra special care to unload and uh, load on the trucks and then also to unload and unload those um, out of their crates and install them on the walls. 
Well, thank you again. Um, another uh, Holly expresses uh, gratitude as well for this fascinating talk. You're and I also, I really want to emphasize what you mentioned earlier, Art, um, how important it is that we're documenting all of these processes and just give you um, great credit for all you're doing to tell the story, to document it for, not just for sharing in programs like this, but for the legacy um, and the history of the institution. Been, I've been here long enough to know that has not always been the case. So I'm thrilled that you're doing well, thank uh, this you. work. It's it's my pleasure. It's it's uh, really a treat for me too. So it's it's thrilling. Each each week brings off uh, new challenges and um, exciting new projects. So it's great to be able to share this stuff with you guys. Well, thank you so much, Amy, and thank you so much, Art, for that incredibly comprehensive presentation. Everyone, I hope that you really enjoyed the presentation chock full of behind the scenes insights about some of the exhibitions that have been on view in the last several years. Um, hopefully this gives you new depth and perspective for your next visit to the museum. Um, you'll probably notice things you never noticed before. Um, but we also hope it gives you a sense of um, just the complex and detailed labor that goes into mounting exhibitions and keeping things running at the museum. So thank you so much for being supporters and being instrumental in making all of that possible. We really truly appreciate your ongoing support and commitment to the museum.